grandfather, George Tiffin Stewart, along with Khan Bidwell, uh, was involved in the importation of this vehicle around about 1900 or 1899 for Khan's younger brother, John. And John Bidwell used it for quite a number of years, travelling from their sheep station in the wire wrapper into Featherston and back. And it then came into the possession of my father, who didn't really do much with it except keep it in the backyard in their Featherston home. Uh, and my older brothers used to play on it without the spark plug in and push each other around the yard. So the vehicle really has been in the family for over a hundred years and uh, a family member was involved in the importation and he would therefore probably be one of the earliest motor vehicle importers in New Zealand. Not necessarily the earliest but one of the earliest. Strictly speaking, this uh, is not a De Dion tricycle, it is an MMC, which is the motor manufacturing company of uh, Coventry in the UK. MMC <coughs> made De Dion tricycles, complete, made the engines and so on, under license to De Dion. Uh, I have a De Dion surface carburetor on this. And only in the last week or so, I've been given a photograph from England of an MMC in absolutely original condition, and I noticed that it has a DD on surface carburetor. So it would appear that MMC did not make their own surface carburetor, but they made these engines, and the engines were used extensively in other uh, motorcycles and aerial tricycles <coughs> and all that sort of thing. And a great number of them were used on uh, tricycles which were used in the Boer War as uh, what we would have called later on dispatch riders' vehicles. And, I, I, and there was a great number, thousands of them, I believe. So, is it an MMC or a Dedean? It's a hybrid, really. It's a bit of each. But I think it's legitimately so because that's the way they were made originally. And you had to present yourself to the police to get fuel for it? Yes, the fuel um, originally uh, in the 19, early 1900s, um, petroleum as a fuel was, was a new technology and uh, volatility and things like that were not particularly well known. And they made mixtures of petroleum distillate and they used a lot of naphtha uh, and stuff like that to increase the volatility. Um, Nowadays, uh, modern petrol is not very suitable for these carburetors because it's not very volatile. When I was a kid, if you spilled a bit of petrol on your hand, it would immediately evaporate and leave your hand feeling cold. Today, it just sits there. It doesn't seem to make any difference at all. So what they're doing in the UK is mixing uh, hexane, which is again a distillate uh, from petroleum and is uh, basically used as a solvent uh, in paint thinners, uh, a paint remover. In, in very low proportions it's actually used as a, a medium for removing the oil from nuts, um, I believe. So hexane was the, uh, was the objective. Now when I started to investigate the availability of hexane, I found that you could buy hexane in New Zealand, but what I couldn't find out was what proportions they used in England. They kept sending me a picture of the of the label and it says that it's hexane and so on and so forth, but it didn't tell me what proportion. Finally, one of the guys said, I think they use 25% hexane and 75% and petrol. So I said, that's good enough for me, away we go. So I, after some difficulty, got in touch with a company on the North Shore in Auckland who would supply hexane. The first company I got involved with was in Pukekohe very understanding, very helpful, um, but they wanted me to buy a 200 litre drum of the fuel, which of course had lasted several lifetimes. 
So the North Shore Company uh, said, yes, we can supply you 20 litres of uh, hexane, but you have to have a police permit to buy it because it can be used as a precursor in illicit drug making and therefore you've got to be uh, uh, approved as a, a, a non-threatening sort of person on the drug scene before you're allowed to buy it. I had to fill out a form and the form had to go to the police and had to go back and had to have a copy of my passport and so on and so forth. But we finally got the fuel. So we have a little can over there of hexane and plastic container. But the way this started up on what's a relatively warm day, what's it, 16, 17 degrees I suppose, um, that mixture seems to me to be right and it obviously runs well, so I don't have a fuel problem. Tyres are another thing people frequently ask, how do you get tyres for this? The extraordinary thing is that these tyres all came from China and in China they are still making these beaded edge tyres which again is an obsolete and very poor type of tyre but they still make them and use them on their rickshaws why on earth they don't use a straight sided tyre I just do not know so tyres can be purchased not too expensive considering what they are main components of, of the vehicle, the back axle, differential, uh, the engine and so forth for probably 30 or 40 years and hadn't done anything with it until about three years ago I decided that if it was ever going to be restored I'd better do it or it would never happen. So I did some research and the problem I was faced with basically was that the forward part of the frame, the front forks and so on, was missing. I think they were probably removed to transport it around the country when the family shifted uh, from the wire wrapper to Auckland and so on, and they got lost. <laughs> so um, I found that there was a chap in the UK who was making complete frames for people wishing to build up these. So he manufactured for me the front fork and this part of the frame and the grafted that onto the back end where they had a, the, uh, the genesis of the complete vehicle. Um, the original vehicle, uh, which I mentioned previously, was a hot tube ignition, which was a primitive and rather unsatisfactory arrangement. They had a, a, a tube, a steel tube, which uh, had admission into the cylinder head, and it had a little burner on it and you had to light the burner, heat the tube, and then when the thing was turning and compression took place, it forced vapour up into the hot tube, that exploded and that ran the engine. One of the major problems with that was you had no control over advance and retard, and the burners used to blow out and they were pretty unsatisfactory altogether, so um, when I began to examine the bits that I had, I found that the engine had been converted from hot tube to a coil ignition system with a primitive um, contact breaker on the end. Now the interesting thing to me is that although it was hot tube ignition when it was new, the timing gear arrangement in here provided for a contact breaker and the advance and retard mechanism was all provided for here. So it's rather strange that, that the manufacturer, whilst using an unsatisfactory uh, hot tube, was preparing the way to go to coil ignition. So um, uh, with the help of David Porter and others, uh, we have rebuilt the uh, ignition in true form. It's exactly as it, as it should be for an original ignition system um, and we've replaced the hot tube with a sparkler. In the production models, when they finally gave up the hot tube, the spark plug actually came out on this side. So this will look strange to a lot of people when they see this for the first time and if they know anything about the deal on tricycles, they say, spark plug is in the wrong place. And technically you can say it is, but it seems to work all right there. 
Is it? Oh, did we talk about the surface carburetor? No. The surface carburetor is a very interesting device, and again, it was very experimental. Um, uh, it was necessary, of course, to have fuel vapour going to the engine, and carburetors, as were used a little bit later on, were almost unknown. But what they did here, they produced a tank of these proportions, and this held fuel when you started up to about halfway. And attached to this tube here is a flat plate which you control the height of so that it's just above the level of the top of the fuel. And when the engine's running, the air is being sucked down that tube spreads out beneath the plate and on top of the fuel, picks up the vapour and that then with the introduction of extra air in this other control valve here is mixed and comes up this tube into the engine. And they work extraordinarily well as you possibly noticed. It the first time started up in 100 years and it only took a couple of attempts to have it going and it ran well. An amazing piece of equipment. One had to be aware of the fact that the fuel level would be dropping all the time you were riding. But there's a wire in there which has a cold float on the bottom. And if you couldn't feel that wire, you knew that the gap between the plate and the fuel had got too wide. And you simply pushed this down a little bit. So they were pretty tricky to operate. You had to watch that. You had a uh, advance and retard for the ignition, you had a, a throttle, which they didn't recommend the use of for controlling speed. Um, they recommended the use of the advance and retard primarily, and the ignition stop switch if you wanted to stop the engine going around the sharp corner. <coughs> this controlled the extra air. That one there is the half compression, so that you reduce the compression uh, in order to get it uh, turning over when you're starting up. And you just simply, well, it's open there and it's closed down there. <coughs> and I have to change the back. Obviously, in the period before bows and cables, Actually used in uh, diesel engines uh, of large capacity for starting up with, uh, with spark ignition. But it happens to be very suitable for what we require. We'll soon find out. In this particular machine, the spark plug's in the wrong place, one might say. The reason being that originally this engine, when this was manufactured, tube ignition. What, what year is this? Um, and, uh, 1898. I had some last minute instructions from the UK on how to start this machine for the first time in over a hundred years. We ensure that all fluids are at the correct level, which means that you make sure there's a bit of oil in the engine and some fuel in the surface carburetor here. Um, centralise the controls, turn the ignition off, open the uh, half compression valve and have somebody push you along the ground for about 30 feet. Then um, turn the ignition on, close the half compression valve, have somebody push you for about 10 feet and it should start. We can't do all that because we haven't got a flat enough piece of ground, so somebody's going to use a bit of leg power, hopefully, to crank it over, and we'll see if we can get it running. Now, this is your master control for the ignition. And when you turn it towards you, it's on. If you want to stop the engine, just move it like that, and it should stop. I have the master key in my hand, which controls the battery supply to the ignition system and you can yank that out and it'll stop too but this would stop the engine. Put the key in the shallot 
and it won't back because it's not in the right position on the thing. Okay, so we're running it with, with the spat. Okay, you can remove the box now. I can put my weight on this. Now, ignition handle a quarter turn away from me. Well, if you want to spin it up further. That was, that was, on, that was on fire then. Well, that was successful. Very successful. Yeah. Incredibly successful. <coughs> so that's our surface cover. Yeah. Bravo. I, I thought we'd be here for hours trying to get going. Sounds like something loading and unloading. No, there's the, 